you know, at this time, I'll hand it over to Sister Sunita for us to have our welcome and uh, so forth. Thank you, Sister Sunita. Good afternoon, Church. Happy Good Sabbath. Afternoon. Sabbath. I would like to take a moment to extend a very warm welcome to everyone visiting us for the first time. Whether you are a visitor or watching on YouTube, we are delighted to have you here. And I would also like to welcome our regular members of our church. For opening him is 499, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Have our scripture reading. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath church. For our scripture reading, I have chosen uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. May God uh, richly bless the portion of scriptures that we have read. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. At this time, can we just bow our heads reverently on Neil, the several position you are able to take at this time as we talk with our Lord. Love and kind Father, love and thank you so much for bringing us together, whether we're on Zoom or we're on YouTube, wherever we are, we thank you that you are able to bring us together this afternoon because of your love and what you have done for us 
during this past week. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide us, continue to give us the desires of our hearts. We know that many of us may have gone through difficulties, may have had problems. Some might still be experiencing it at this very moment. But Lord, we ask that you will draw close to them. Help them to realise that they are not alone. Help them to realise that you are there with them. Because you have promised us that when we go through the fire, when we go into the water, you are there with us too. And therefore there is nothing that can happen to us that you do not feel and know. And you are able to comfort us. So, Father, we ask that you draw close to each and every one. We also ask that you will be with our young people, wherever they are, whatever they're doing. You know their state of mind. You know what they're thinking. And you have promised us that you know our thoughts from afar off. And therefore, Lord, we ask that you will help to direct their course, that it will come in harmony with your will. We ask that you be the parents. Many of this time are trying their best to find ways of coping, not just with the pandemic, but also with coping being at home and their children at home, and even with their jobs. And so, Father, we ask that you will draw close to them too. Be with us, sick moments, those who are bereaved. And we ask, even those who are feeling alone, that you will draw close to them. And so, Father, we ask that you will open our minds and give us understanding during our service today. We also ask that you will be with our speaker. You know him, you know everything about him, you know his family, you know where he's coming from. And so we ask that you will cover him with your blood. So as he speaks to us, our hearts will burn with him as it. And we will know that you have given us the message. And so, loving Father, we ask that you will forgive each and every one of us where we have sinned and help us to know that you are our provider in whatever situation we find ourselves in. Help us to realize that we can depend on you. And so, Father, we thank you for what you have done for us and what you are doing for us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 At this time, at this time we'll have our children's story. We have Jessica with us. So Jessica, my daughter, she's going to take the children's story. Today's children's story is going to be about saving lives through kindness and trusting God. This story is about a woman named Rahab, and it starts with the death of Moses the prophet. Moses led the Israelites to the promised land, but for unfortunate reasons, he himself couldn't go there, and so he was laid to rest on Mount Nebo. This meant that the Israelites needed a new leader. Um, does anyone of the children want to tell me if they know who was the leader after Moses? It was Joshua. Yes, well done. It was Joshua. Joshua was a prophet and he was chosen by God to lead the children of Moses after lead the children of Israel after Moses. One day God came to Joshua as he had a special task for him. This task was to capture and take over Jericho. But before he left, the Lord gave him a promise, which is found in Joshua chapter one, verses nine. Can somebody please read that? Joshua chapter 1 verses 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. 
for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So this is a promise that God left with Joshua. But Jericho was a big city with great big walls surrounding it. And the people who lived there thought that nobody could get through because the walls would protect them from anyone who decided to attack. The people in Jericho were also very bad, but there were a few of them who lived there who had heard about the Israelites' God. One of these was a woman named Rahab. Rahab had heard stories about how God delivered the Israelites from captivity out of Egypt and how he had performed many miracles while they wandered through the wilderness. The most important thing that she had heard, though, was that the Lord had delivered Jericho the land that she lived in, into the hands of the Israelites. Since Joshua had been commanded by the Lord to take this land, he first wanted to see what was in store for them. So he sent two men to spy on the land so that they could prepare. Now the spies entered the land of Jericho, but maybe because they wore different clothes or acting a bit suspicious, the king of Jericho found out that they were in his city so the spies rushed to take refuge. Do you know who accepted them into her house? I'll give you a clue. We mentioned her earlier. Rahab? Yes. It was Rahab. She was kind enough to let them into her house and take refuge. But soon later, the king's soldiers came to check everybody's house for the spies. Rahab was well prepared and she told the spies to go and hide in her rooftop between the fibers that she used to make her clothes. When the king's soldiers came to her house, they asked for the spies, but she told them that she didn't know where they were. So they searched everywhere inside her house, but fortunately for the spies, they were well hidden and their search was a failure since through God, Rahab had kept the spies safe. Now, because of this, Rahab explained what her situation was to the spies. She told them about how she heard of their amazing God, and she truly believed that their God was the one true God. Since she had shown kindness to the spies, she asked that they show that same kindness back and save her and her family's lives when the time came for the Israelites to attack. So they told her to tie a red string to her window because her house was built into the city walls. The red string would help them to identify her house when the time came for their attacks so that they could help her and all of her family. So the spies left to return to the Israelite camp and Rahab tied the red string to her window just as the spies said. Finally, the time came for the Israelites to attack Jericho and claim the land for themselves. The spies told Joshua about Rahab and how she saved their lives. So Joshua told them to go and save her and her family, and he would take responsibility if anybody got hurt. And they did. They saved her and all of her family, and they left Jericho together, and they were saved, as the Lord delivered Jericho to the Israelites. So to end this, can I please ask for somebody to read Joshua chapter 1, verses 5, and somebody else to read Joshua chapter 24, verses 15. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Thank you. And uh, now can somebody please read Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom ye will serve, okay. whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you very much. So from this story, I want you to take that even though Rahab was from Jericho and she believed, she believed in God and she showed kindness to people who weren't from her land, because of this, she was saved, and we too can spread kindness to other people just like Rahab did. Uh, can I please ask for somebody to pray for me? Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for being with us every step of the way. Please help the 
please help the children through to um to help us to be more like you, Lord. Je Jesus came to this earth to die for us, Lord, and please help us to recognize that and ha please help us to be a part of our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you very much to all Amen. the children for listening. Amen. 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 At this time, we will have the introduction of speaker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Brother Solomon. I would, I would like to welcome our speaker today. He is none other than Erla Jairaz, who is well known to our family and to our church as well. He is a humble man of God and very wise in his teaching as well. And he preached in our Williston church in a couple of times. And especially Amu is sitting beside me. You know why she is sitting beside me. <laughs> Amu likes his teaching very much. So we are very happy to have him in Wilston Church to share the word of God to us. I humbly request the Lord's presence is always with him while he preaching this hour. He is from Sutton Coldfield Church. He is the elder in Sutton Coldfield Church. And he has doing marvelous work in the Sutton Coldfield Church. And he is the man of God. And I, I wish him the God's blessings always with him and with his family. And his children are very talented as well. They can play piano, violin, and all guitar, and all the musical item. They can, the God has given the good talents for the children. And they're using the talents in the God's vineyard. I want once again welcome Brother Jairaz, Elder Jairaz. And before he preach, you have a meditational. Lord, I offer you 
That song was sung by Nandita Danesh, one of my close friends' uh, daughter. She is also like my daughter, and I'd like to thank her for preparing the song for us this Sabbath and blessing us with the song. And I'd also like to thank uh, everyone uh, at Bilston, the church, the elders, the pastors, for giving me this uh, privilege and opportunity to come and share from God's word, especially um, Pastor Solomon, who was uh, behind uh, this and uh, trying to put together uh, for me to come and speak to you. And I also like to thank him for the warm welcome and introduction that he has uh, given to me. And above all, you know, I need to thank God for uh, keeping uh, us safe through these difficult times and using uh, me where and my family and friends wherever uh, possible in ministering for him. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to go into our message today. And uh, let me share uh, my slide here. Yes, so in recent times, um, I have been immersing myself in studying the life of uh, Jacob. And I have entitled my message this morning as Striving with God. And the theme would be Encountering God Through Prayer. Now, I've always um, thought about Jacob as a, as a schema, and I did not keep very good impression upon Jacob, considering all the biblical characters. But in fact, as I read through his life story, I find it surprising that Jacob ends up in Paul's Hall of Fame. You know, Paul in Hebrews chapter 11, he writes about all these people who lived in great faith. And he does not fail to mention the name of Jacob. And therefore, I thought that um, studying the life of Jacob uh, would be a rich blessing, not only to me, but to all of us today. Now, before we go into the study, let us bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing. Our eternal Heavenly Father, we are so delighted to come to your presence this, morning, this afternoon and open up thy word. We thank you for the wonderful freedom that you have given to us to come and study together. Although we are not meeting face to face with one another, but we have opened doors for us through this platform to share thy word and encourage one another in these difficult times. Lord, as we study, may your Holy Spirit continue to enrich us and fill us 
um, with wisdom and knowledge and understanding of how we can cope and live and conduct ourselves in these uh, last days. Be with us, be with uh, myself and assist me, Father, and be with the awaiting congregation, be with uh, each and every one of us this afternoon as we study this word. Thank you for hearing our prayers. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So when you look into the life of Jacob, the story begins with a divine oracle or a divine prediction as the two twins are born, Esau and Jacob. Although Jacob's life spans the rest of the book of Genesis, we see so much about his character as we read through uh, these stories of Jacob. And Jacob's life can be divided into three broad sections. You know? And you can see in, in my slide here, you could see that the first section could be, the first episode, if you want to call it, could be Jacob and Esau episode. And the second would be Jacob and Laban episode. And the third, again, would be Jacob and Esau episode. This is how the core of Jacob's life have been divided. Now, these episodes are linked together by two major encounters that Jacob had with his Lord. Now, the first of these occurred at Bethel. Do you all, children, do you all remember the Jacob's ladder story? That's that's where Jacob first encountered his Lord as he is leaving the promised land and he is going towards Haran, where his uncle lived. Or, in other words, you can say he is leaving the promised land and he is fleeing away from his brother Esau. And the second encounter that takes place with uh, God is when Jacob is actually coming back towards the promised land. Okay, follow me very closely. Where you, you uh, know the story of uh, Jacob wrestling with that stranger. Children, I'm trying to get your attention too. So here Jacob is wrestling with the stranger. So this is the second encounter that he's having with his God. So we are going to look at these two encounters, and we will see how we can enhance our life with a close communion, with a close fellowship, in engage in that meaningful relationship with our God of heaven. Now, as you read through Jacob's life, as you read uh, Genesis chapter 25, you will notice that Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. So here, before Rebecca is about to give birth, Isaac is calling for the Lord's help. And because she was childless, the Lord answered his prayer. So we all know and understand that every child that comes into this world comes through the approval of God. Today, you and me live upon this world. It's because of God has blessed us to come into this world through our parents. And here we can see that the babies jostle with one another. Yeah? Isaac was 60 years old when Rebecca gave birth. Now, you can almost begin to sense the tension that is beginning in the family right before the children were born. And we can see that there is a prediction that God gives here. And he says that, the Bible says that the elder shall serve the younger. So in this one verse, we can see how um, the tension is building up in the family of Isaac. Now, when you see the naming of these children, you could see that Esau means like hairy or red or scarlet. And Jacob would mean that he who grabs the heel or it would mean he who deceives. Think of a name 
like that today. Would we ever name our child like that? But in God's providence, you know, the names became very prophetic here in our patriarch's life. You can see that Jacob ended up living to his end, which we will see further. And as you further go on to look at the beginning of uh, uh, this particular family, you will see, so the boys grew, okay? And Lisa was a skillful hunter, which means you could already have this imagination that he might be a strong, hairy man. And he was in the field. And he was an outdoor man. He was not an indoor man. He was the one who was out and about. And But talking about Jacob, you can see it. Jacob was mild man. Okay, This word mild here is tam, which is actually used to describe the perfection of Job in the Bible. And somehow uh, Jacob begins with this kind of description, like he was pious and he was uh, undefiled. And then you further read on here that because uh, Isaac loved Esau because he did eat his venison. So he loved Esau. Why? Because Esau begins to cook very well. And so, you know, the saying comes to my mind, the way through the heart is through the stomach. So here, Isaac somehow got acquaintance and this engagement and this relationship with Esau because of his venison. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Now, as you look through this uh, family, you will soon come to understand that Jacob, who was called to be a mild man, turns out to be actually having a reputation to cheat. You know, you could see the very fact that he comes out of the womb holding his brother's uh, heel. And also another instance when Esau returned home uh, from hunting and he was starving and he was really hungry. And Jacob took that opportunity to recover the birthright that was denied at his birth. Just imagine, you know, Jacob had all the justification to say, we both were born on the same day. And how could the birthright go to um, Esau? You know, he could have been debating this. And now he found an opportunity here. And he uses this opportunity to tell him that if he could, you know, by deceit, take the birthright from um, Esau. Now, this was, uh, when you read through the text, you will really find out that this was a, premeditated act on the part of Jacob because Jacob, he, he always had this desire towards Esau's birthright. For children, I'm saying those of you who don't know what a birthright is, birthright is something that the firstborn receives. Uh, it's, a, it's a blessing in the patriarchal age. It was the ultimate blessing that they can receive. But that's in its simplest form that I'm telling you. So this blessing was coveted by the uh, younger son, that is Jacob, which does not belong to him, but he is actually coveting a good thing, but in a wrong way. And that's not right. And as you read through this passage, you would also try and um, you will also easily quickly understand that there was partiality that was prevailing in this family. You see, here you see like Isaac loved Esau and Jake, Rebecca loved Jacob. Here itself, the division began in the family. You must have thought, you know, when if you have uh, uh, read the story of um, Isaac and Rebecca, it's a wonderful love story, isn't it? You would never imagine that this couple will have such a disjointed family. You know, the problems already has begun in the family favoritism. And if you read the story even closer, uh, the language and the text that clearly um, gives us the idea that Isaac never uh, called Jacob as his son until he came to know that he blessed Jacob. But all the while he calls uh, Esau as his own son. And if you look at uh, Rebekah, Rebekah uh, always addressed Jacob as her son. 
and she never addressed Esau as her son. Rather, she would address Esau as the brother of Jacob. So you could see how far the parents have brought in division among the brothers themselves. Now, as you read through this uh, chapter, you will also uh, have two thoughts that will come to your mind. One, that Isaac is getting old and needs to pass his blessing. That's one. And two, his mouth is watering for some tasty food. Okay, you know Isaac was now getting old. He, he was about 137 years old and he felt that he was in his deathbed. He's not going to live long. But although we know, you know, through reading the scripture, he lived another 43 years after this particular event. But you can understand the aging father want to now begin to uh, transfer his responsibilities to his older son. Now, Isaac, he is permitting his taste buds to influence his heart and his conscience. This can be also our uh, problem too. Sometimes our weaknesses can influence us important decisions in our lives. And he determines here to bestow the birthright blessing upon his older son. Remember, in spite of his deliberate disregard for the birthright. We know Esau disregarded the birthright. He sold the birthright already to his brother for a soup of lentil. Now, this is a grave mistake that Esau had already committed and Isaac knows about this. And not only that, he has uh, this tendency uh, to seek women from a foreign nation. He already had married uh, you know, the Hittite women who, who are already in the house causing problem. Now, considering all this fact that Esau continued to dis, uh, despise the birthright, Isaac still was here willing to give the birthright to his older son. Now you can see all, also some play of words here as you read the story. The word here is uh, pekora, which means birthright, and bereka, which means blessing. Okay, so you can, if you connect these words in the story, it goes like this. While Esau sold the pekora, that's a birthright, for a bowl of lentil, for Jacob, we see here the father does something similar. The father is going to give the blessing of the birthright, this is the bereka exchange of some venison. Are you following me closely? Yeah? So, and not only that, now Rebecca is trying to get the bereka, that is the blessing of Isaac for her favorite son through making the venison for the father. Now the entire family is trying to toss this birthright between themselves through deceit and food. Such a great blessing of God is being despised by this family. My brothers and sisters, as you keep reading the story, it's quite turns out to be like in verse uh, eight of chapter 27. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from, from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then in verse 10, then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. Now you can see Rebecca has been listening to the instruction given by her husband to Esau, her older son, and anticipated her husband's intentions. Now, she must have thought, you know, what this old man is trying to do? Does he even know what he's trying to do? Does he even know that Esau is mixing with all the wrong kinds of people and he's marrying the Canaanite woman? He's 
not even uh, considering the tribe's uh, respect at all. And he goes out and he, he does all sorts of things. And yet this man, uh, old man Isaac, want to uh, give the birthright to him. How could that be possible? Did he not even know and understand the prediction that was given at the birth of these twins that the younger shall serve the elder? So shouldn't by right, this birthright shouldn't it be given to the younger son. You see, sometimes in all our mistakes, we try to justify it so that we can look at it. And that's what Rebecca was doing. And in Petrius and Prophet, we understand clearly that she, uh, we read that they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. That's in Jacob and Rebecca. And they did not want to wait for God to do the work for them. They were unwilling to submit the matter into God's hand, my brothers and sisters. She so quickly plotted this deception that Jacob made, and she makes sure that Jacob gets this birthright. But she forgot to understand that she was about to pay a very hefty price for this deception. You know what? She never saw her son rest of her life because of this mistake of Rebecca. She never saw, till her death, she never saw her favorite son anymore. How much, my brothers and sisters, through our mistakes, through the deceit that we commit against our God, we are losing great blessings of our life. And as we read Patriots and Prophets, as we continue to read it, it tells like this, that Rebecca bitterly repented the wrong counsels she had given her son. It was the means of separating him from her. This wrong counsel became the means to separate the mother and the son. And she never saw his face again from the hour when he received the birthright, Jacob weighed down with self-condemnation. He had sinned against, sinned against his father, his brother, his own soul, and against my brothers, against God, my brothers and sisters. In one short hour, he had made work for a lifelong repentance. In one short hour, he had made a work of lifelong repentance. This, this mistake that he committed is going to travel with him, journey with him, rest of his life. The most cruel deception of Jacob, my brother and sister, that I was reading the story, was that Jacob's daring plot to trick his aged and blind father. Well, how many of us, you know, we use others' weaknesses, whether it be in the family or in the church or at work, how many of us try to use others' weaknesses to take advantage? And here, this ugly deed that is recorded in Genesis chapter 27 will be traveling with Jacob throughout his life. Jacob cheated his father, betrayed his brother. This memory will never be shaken off my brothers and sisters from his life. The price was so high that he had to pay. Jacob had lost the respect of his father, the trust of his brother within a fraction of a moment. Jacob lived up to his name. He premeditated and calculated and lies and deceit only defined his life, my brothers and sisters. He was jealous of the birthright and he prepared to receive it at any cost. And he ended up stealing it from his brother. As you read through the story in Genesis chapter 28, you see that so he came to a certain place. He came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun has set. And he took one of the stone of that place and put it on his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top 
reached our heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on him. Now here, Jacob is going out of his father's land. He's going out of his father's home. He's going out of Beersheba, the land in which he lived. And he's going towards a strange land. He's going towards a land called Haran. And he is leaving his father's home. He is wending through those hills and those valleys. Maybe the weather was beating him up. Maybe the road was dusty. Maybe his foot was sore, my brothers and sisters. Maybe even above all these things, his heart was bleeding for the mistakes that he has done. And here he is tired, a weary man. And he comes to this place to sleep. He takes a stone as his pillow. Maybe the heaven was his dome of covering. And he, there he is lying down. A young man with guilty conscience. He was here recently. He has just deceived his father, stolen the birthright from his mother, and the death threat was hanging over his head. And here, this young man was lying down, not knowing what to do. And his mind would have wandered back to his home. And over all the wickedness that he must have done, here, a deceitful and supplanting life that he was living would have all come through his mind, my brothers and sisters. The cause of so many heartaches that he has caused to his mother, to his father and brother, would have all come to his mind. The cause of the consuming rage that he has brought upon his brother, the sorrow and disgrace that he has caused upon his father has all been now coming upon his mind. He must have thought, oh, my mother's home, which instead of being a miniature of paradise upon this earth, he, Jacob, he has turned this home into a hell. And now he is hopeless. He is helpless and he is homeless. And he has been an outcast here, my brothers and sisters. He was fleeing for his life. And now he is lying down here upon his tomb. What a pathetic situation here for a man who could have lived on this paradise earth in his home beautifully, my brothers and sisters. But yet he has turned everything on the other direction. My brothers and sisters, here as he lay down, he has this vision, a vision of a plan of redemption, a plan where he could be redeemed from this pathetic situation, a plan where he would be, where God would restore everything back to him. This ladder that he saw in dream represents Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ, I want to tell you, is the anointed and the appointed medium of communication between you and your God, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is the one who bridges this gulf between humanity and heaven. And here where Jacob was at the ebb of his weakness, where he was low, where he was depressed, and because of all these mistakes that he has committed, Jesus Christ had come to him to infuse him with the power of heaven so that he can become an overcomer, my brothers and sisters. Here, Jesus is the gap that bridged all the problems for him. And here, he gets this assurance. He gets this comfort. He gets this uh, much needed assurance uh, from the God of heaven, the God of his father, Abraham. The God of his father Isaac is now here with him, representing as a ladder. With this great assurance here, my brothers and sisters, Jacob continues. And Jacob uh, is being offered this beautiful promises uh, in verse 13. You will read, and the land whereupon thou liest, to thee I will give it to you. That is the first promise God has given to Jacob. And then here again, uh, the second one, he says, and to thy seed in thee and in thy seed, all these families of the earth will be blessed. And will, that's the second promise. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And the third one, he says, I will bring thee again to this land for I will not leave thee. What amazing promises here, my brothers and sisters, that he will give the land to him and that this world, this earth will be blessed because of him. And then the Lord will be with him. 
amazing promises. The man who was running for his life, the man who was just done and committed great wickedness against his father's home and against the God of heaven. Here, God comes to him. Jesus, the Redeemer, comes to him and promises him these great promises. When you and I think that we have done great mistakes against God, great, committed great sins against God, our wrongdoings have overwhelmed not only us, but our fellow believers and our family members. We go to the of depression. We go through the extent where we think the whole world has fallen around us. But yet, my brothers and sisters, the assurance that you get through the story of Jacob here is that God is with us. He is the one who connects you back to heaven, my brothers and sisters. And as you read through the story, Jacob continues uh, to respond to the blessing that God has given to him. And Jacob goes on to say, if, notice the word, if there, yeah, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely back to my father's house. Then, notice the word, then, if you do all this for me, God, then the Lord God will be my God. And this stone that I have slept as a, uh, I, I, this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you one penny. Notice here, my brothers and sisters, notice the answer of, the response of Jacob here. That rings a typical bargain in prayer of many desperate believers. Now, if you bless me, Lord, then I will serve you. If you do this to me, Lord, then I will give you my tithe. If you do this to my family, I will do this. You know, this sort of prayer is a bargain prayer. Jacob here bargains with God. Jacob bargained with a conditional promise, my brothers and sisters. If the Lord, God fulfills his part of the bargain and in return, I will do this. If you take me back to my home where I came from, then you will be my God. He is cutting a deal with his God. Of course, it is unnecessary to deal since God in his dream has already promised Jacob the, what he would do for him. Jacob does not even need to negotiate here. God has already before this negotiation promised what he's going to do for him. Jacob does not realize that he can't negotiate his way through success with God of this universe. You know, this incident at Bethel revealed yet more Jacob's selfish, scheming character, my brothers and sisters. Even after the visitation of the Almighty, he still wanted to drive up a bargain with him. Jay need not have gone for a second response and say these things that he said. The Lord has already promised him. You know, many of us think that Jacob's dream here was his conversion, but it was actually not. At least we can say, we can at least go for, to an extent and say that the God who was until now, maybe probably as an academic or irrelevant to Jacob, is at least now, he's becoming dearer to him. Jacob at least begins to recognize him. We can go to understand to that much uh, extent. But Jacob still at this point was the one who was bargaining with God. He wanted his self to be secure. As you continue to read the story, my brothers and sisters, surely the Lord is in this place. And I know it not. How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And he sets up his stone pillow for a pillar and the name and name the place Bethel, the house of God. And Jacob awakes from this dream 
and he's afraid. He says, surely the Lord is in this place. And this is his first experience with God. And after this Bethel experience, Jacob meets Laban. The story goes long, so I'm going to just quickly summarize it due to time. But you can understand that he, move, he moves on from Bethel. He reaches his uncle's home. Once he's in his uncle's home, he once again begins to rely on his own ability. During the next 20 years from Bethel, Jacob actually grows humble through all his life's experience. Uh, those of you who would have read his story uh, would, would understand this even better. What he had previously done to others has is being now done to him through his uncle. Jacob's 20 years of service with his uncle or in Mesopotamia were characterized by jealousy, contention, by intrigue, and so on. You know, the son-in-law and the father-in-law in their attempts to deceive each other is the rest of the story. And in this process, as he was in his uncle's house, as he was working for him, he was charmed by Rachel, his uncle's daughter. So he agreed uh, to her father that uh, he would pay a dowry by working for him for seven years without a pay. But on the wedding night, he discovered that he was outwitted by his father-in-law, who was more skillful at deception than him. You could see that this Jacob, who was the greatest of all deceivers, his name is Jacob, the one who deceives, there in Mesopotamia, he sees someone who has outwitted his deceit. Jacob, in all these experiences, is learning lessons. And then to marry Rachel, the woman he loved, he agrees to work for another seven years, my brothers and sisters. So 14 years to get the wife he desired. You know, Jacob should have known better here, my brothers and sisters, who have been given the promise by God. You saw all those promises that was given to him. He could have held on to those promises. He should have trusted on those promises without having to resort to family, uh, to, to polygamy. And his family grew bigger and bigger. And on a subsistent income, having to maintain such a large family, you can understand the struggle that he was going through in his uh, father-in-law's home. Life brought it on so hard for him during these years. And during these years, there's no mention of any heavenly vision or any revelation that came to him to brighten his life. Nothing, nothing at all. 20 years. And the Lord had not given him any visions or any hope. But as you read through the story in Genesis chapter 31, there comes hope, my brothers and sisters. You see that then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to your land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. Isn't that wonderful, my brothers and sisters? Here, Jacob is beginning phase two. He is becoming a seasoned man mellowed by life. He has right for higher life. Now, if not, even if you don't uh, agree that he was a perfect man there, at least we can all agree that he was ready. He was not yet that fully changed man, but he was ready. The foundation has been laid for him to have the ultimate encounter with God, my brothers and sisters. And then when he saw a perfect opportunity, when in the absence of Laban, he left Mesopotamia. He left his father-in-law's home. And now he's separate from Laban. And now he is on his own with his own family after so many years. And Jacob is now on his way towards his father's home. He is on his way towards the promised land. And now my brothers and sisters, as he's journeying towards his promised land, he is met by two angels who come and speak to him. We don't know, the Bible does not say what this encounter was about, you know, but no doubt 
their presence, these two angels' presence, has at least given him courage and confidence, my brothers and sisters. Perhaps that explains why in the next verse, as you read, you will see that he sends messengers to his brother Esau. He gains courage from these angels. And now he is ready. He is at least willing to meet his brother Esau, who was looking for him to kill him. Now, after the messengers return from Esau, and they say, you know what, Jacob? Esau is now coming down to meet you with 400 armed men. Remember, imagine Jacob's situation here. No wonder Jacob was greatly afraid. I think in verse 7 it says that he was greatly afraid and distressed. And as you read through the passage, he has nowhere to go, my brothers and sisters. He, if he was the old Jacob, he could have resorted to deceit again. If he was the old Jacob, he could have resorted to battle and war because now his family is large enough. He could have fought battle against Esau. But if he was the old Jacob, he would have found human help to overcome his problems. But he's not, he's no longer that old Jacob. As Jacob saw the Lord was with him. He know he can resort back to the Lord. And here the verse goes on to say, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, who said to me, go back to your country and to your relatives and I will make you prosper. Now Jacob, what he is doing is he is now become very wise in the Lord. Now he is holding on to God's promise. He said, God, didn't you not tell me that this is what you're going to do to me? And now if my life be taken away, how would your promises be fulfilled? This should be our life, my brothers and sisters. We have to hold on to God's promises. He has given us promises after promises in his word. And when you and I are in trouble, this is what we ought to do. We kneel to him in prayer and we pick his promises that he has promised us. And we tell our Lord, our Father, Lord, restore me, redeem me, and provide me help because you have promised me. And this is exactly what Jacob is doing here. This, when I read it, my brothers and sisters, this helped me. This helped my spiritual journey. This helped me to see the Bible in a different perspective. This life of Jacob helped me to see God differently than ever before, my brothers and sisters. Then, having done all that Jacob could do, he divides his family just in case he sends one group of his family in one direction, another group in another direction, in case any one of them encounter and are destroyed by Esau. At least the other family would be kept safe. He sends his family and then he remains behind and he prays by the side of the brook Jabok, my brothers and sisters. He must have met his brother, but he does not want to meet his brother in war, but he wants to meet his brother in peace. So he turns to his God and he asks his God for forgiven, forgiveness and deliverance. Notice what he says here, brothers and sisters. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness that you have shown me, your servant. I have had only my staff when I crossed the Jordan. Remember, he's remembering his past when he saw the Lord the first time and left home under the night sky where he used the stone as his pillow, where he dreamt of this ladder. He's remembering that now and is bringing that promises that God had promised him that day. Now, when he's about to face his brother, um, Esau, and where there is a death threat for him. And he's saying, I am unworthy of all the kindness that you have given me, shown me all these 20 years, Father in heaven. I had only a staff when I went, but now look at me. There are great, he comes with a big family, and there are two groups, and he says, save me. He completely surrenders himself to his God. And it says, I pray from the hand of my brother Esau, 
for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, remember he's holding on to the promise. So you have said, my God of heaven, you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make you dissonant like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Wow. Brothers and sisters, after 21 years that has rolled by, he comes to the same crisis of his life. Sometimes we think because years have passed by, the problems are resolved. No, no. The problems have to be taken to God and God has to settle it for you. You may be having family troubles. There may be someone who must not have been encountering, engaging with some of your close family members. Maybe there is some of you who don't want to have to do with someone. Jacob's story is an example. His brother was looking to kill him, but Jacob here want to restore that relationship. He goes to his father in heaven for help. When he feared the wrath of his brother, whom he had wronged, he cried to the Lord for one more chance. And he prayed here in this brook, Jabo. In that darkness of night, he fell down on his face, my brothers and sisters, and he prayed to God for help. God, help me. Save me. And when you read through uh, Jacob's story, as I read through it, I read it so many times, my brothers and sisters, and I saw that there was true humility in Jacob's prayer. There was true recognition of God's mercy. He desperately needed God's grace for him to live. And he, he pleaded for protection from that imminent danger that was about to come upon him. And here also I saw that he is continuing to um, uh, repeat the promises that God had already promised him. And he also here appreciates that what God has done for him in the past. He says, I'm unworthy of your, your kindness and your faithfulness that you have provided me all these years. Such is, should be the prayer of us, my brothers and sisters. We should pray in like manner as Jacob has prayed. Then you see our life will spring, our Christian experience will spring to victory. A crisis that changed his life for better. You know, sometimes when we uh, go through trials and when we go through trouble, uh, when we have various problems in our lives, we ask God why. Just imagine if Jacob did not go through this trial that he is going through, he wouldn't have befriended his brother. He wouldn't have been able to reach back to his promised home. In all these trials, God was carrying him to victory, my brothers and sisters. In our trials too, when we go through trials, remember God is with you. Jesus, the ladder is connecting you between heaven and the earth. He is the one who is very close to you, my brothers and sisters, just as he was close with Jacob. Now, as you read further the story, you see that so Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him until daybreak. So there was this man who came and wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. And Jacob replied, I will notice this, brothers and sisters, notice this word, reply of Jacob. I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then, he's, then the man said, your name will be no longer Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome. One of Jacob's most touching experience is suggested in these words that we have just read, my brothers and sisters. Jacob was left alone. When we sit alone by ourselves, 
with God. That is when, my brothers and sisters, we see redemption. There, this man wrestled with him until daybreak. Probably the arms were twisted and the legs were seized and the neck were wrenched. But you can see here, Jacob was given that rare opportunity, that glorious opportunity to encounter with his God. How about you and me, my brothers and sisters? He had to face that encounter with his living God and live to tell about it. Jacob revealed himself as a person of highest faith. And God too revealed himself to Jacob in this encounter. And hearing that his outraged brother is coming to meet him with the army of 400 men, uh, Jacob begins to pray as he never prayed in his life. After a while, he found that it was the messenger of the Lord that was wrestling with him and that was struggling, that he was struggling with. And he held on. And Jacob's very life is now at stake. He knows that. And he doesn't know who this mortal foe is who's, who he's resisting with. Where did he come from? It is now life or death. He knows that this is uh, something that he cannot give up. They rest for hours in the darkness. Oh, what a struggle, my brothers and sisters. What agony Jacob passed through. They wrestled, wrestled till the dawn appeared. He wrestled with God. He, in this process, came to understand that this model four is God himself, that he was wrestling until daybreak. And he says that I will not let you go except you bless me. There was victory in Jacob's life, my brothers and sisters. He pressed the battle to the very gate. Now you must be called Israel. You must be called Israel because you are a prince, because you prevail with God. That was a blessing Jacob received as he persisted with his God. You are a prince. And your name from now on is Israel. You have the power with God and you have the power with man. And there was victory, my brothers and sisters. The thought that comes to me is that Lord, the, the Lord God, he says that he is our strength. When we hold on to him, when we cling on to him, when we hold on and press till the gate, and when we stand for the truth, no matter what, then we too are called Israel, my brothers and sisters. And he was a prince. He was a prevailer. He was a overcomer. God's grace was sufficient for him. And from henceforth, he was a different man. His self-confidence was uprooted. His evil, wicked elements of his character were all consumed in the furnace of fire when he wrestled with God. He became a true gold that was refined until the faith of Abraham, the faith of Isaac, appeared undimmed in him, my brothers and sisters. As you read further through the story, you will notice that Esau's mind was completely changed by Jacob's prayer. It was the persistency of Jacob that brought that blessing. He won by perseverance. He had seen, if, if only he had ceased struggling at any point during that night, those blessings would not have come to him. The blessing came because he held on without refusing the angel to go. You know, sometimes our prayers are not answered, you know, why many times, most of the time, that we let go our arms so too soon of the Lord. We let go. We think the Lord's not answering and let him go. And ends our prayer. We must, like Jacob, continue to hold on and cling on to him 
until we find an answer. Persevering, prevailing prayer is what we need to gain victory in our lives. We must, like Jacob, become overcomers. God is there to help us. Jacob, who was a schemer, who trusted in man, now began to rely upon his God. And the angel, or God who was wrestling with him, touched the strongest part of his human body. He touched his hip, indicating that God must break us down to the strongest part of ourself before we are ready to be productive members for his church body. What part of you and me must God break so that we can become faithful unto your Father in heaven? That question lies with you and me, my brothers and sisters. And as you see, the summary of the entire theme that we learned today, you'll see that Jacob, his first journey from his father's home, first his journey away from the promised land, he encounters God at Bethel. But when Jacob is returning back towards the promised land, he encounters God at a place called Peniel, which is not far away from Bethel. And he sees God face to face. And in the first instance, he was alone as he traveled. Only a staff was with him. But now as he returns, he returns with many towards the promised land. He returns with his family, my brothers and sisters. And in the first instance, when he went through, he was with poverty. He had nothing for himself. Now he's returning towards the promised land with great riches and small prosperity and possessions. As he went towards away from the promised land, he was sleeping. He was tired. He was weary. The weather were beating him. He was heartbroken. But now, here, as he enters into the promised land, he is wrestling with his God. He is wrestling. He is awake. He is not asleep. All night, my brothers and sisters, the Bible does not say that he was asleep. The Bible tells, it, it tells us that he was wrestling with his God. And in fact, he does not want to go. Let the God who he was wrestling with to go. Isn't that wonderful? And as you see through again, as he was traveling away from the promised land, God told him, I will not leave you. But when he, in the second encounter, when he's traveling towards the promised land, he is telling, who is telling? Jacob is telling, I will not leave you. Do you see the difference? This is the experience God wants us to have. We who are turn, uh, going towards the promised land, this is the experience God wants us to have. God wants us to hold on to him. Only then we can get there. As you go further, as he was going away from his father's home, God blesses Jacob even without asking. He comes. Jacob does not call upon God and cry to God, but God comes to him seeing his depressed situation. And he blesses him. He promised to bless him. Now, as Jacob is returning to the promised land, here, Jacob is pleading for blessing. What a change. What a change, my brothers and sisters. In the first encounter, Jacob was bargaining with God. If you do to me this, if you do to me that, I am, then I will do this to you. But here, look at this. In the second encounter, Jacob is pleading with God, and there is no bargain at all. There's no bargain. Lord, I completely surrender to you. Whatever is your will, let it be done. He doesn't know, uh, give out any ifs, buts, or this you do or that I will do. No, nothing. Amazing. And then as you see, as he goes away from his father's home, as he is in his encounter, God comes as God. 
He comes as Jehovah. He comes, but when he comes as God, Jacob treats him as a man. But in the second encounter, God comes as a man. He comes as a stranger, but Jacob treats him as a God. Is that our life, my brothers and sisters? Jesus came as a man upon this earth. And he was with us. And he promised us that he will leave his Holy Spirit in our midst. And here, the Spirit is speaking to us today. Jesus, the man who came and lived with us, is also our God. And this is the great assurance that we have today. He connects us to heaven. He connects humanity with heaven. He gives us, he infuses into us the power of heaven when we are at our weakest moment, my brothers and sisters. Finally, I'd like to read this and close. One more slide. When tribulation comes upon us, how many of us are like Jacob? We think it the hand of an enemy and in the darkness we wrestle blindly until our strength is spent and we find no comfort or deliverance. To Jacob, the divine touch at the break of the day revealed the one with whom he had been contending, the angel of the covenant and weeping at and helpless, he fell upon the breast of the infinite love to receive the blessing of which is so long. We also need to lean that, sorry, learn that trial means benefit and not be, not despise the chastening of our Lord, nor faint when we are rebuked of him. Beautiful statement. The one who he is fighting against to the one he is leaning himself upon. He said, I give up, Lord. I surrender everything to you. And he fell on the bosom of the one he was wrestling with. Is that your experience, my brothers and sisters? And finally, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both his sons, both the sons of Jacob, and worshipped, leaning upon the stalk of his staff. See, my brothers and sisters, he never gave up on his God ever since he met him in the second encounter. Is that your encounter? Any trials, any problems, Jacob's life tells us that surrender yourself to God. He takes control of. Maybe you as you were listening to the message today, maybe you were placing yourself into different phases of the life of Jacob. Maybe some of you are running away from your father's home. Maybe some of you are in the land of you know, Mesopotamia, where you are struggling and no, um, no encounter with God, a dry life. Maybe some of you have been instructed of God to travel towards a promised land. I'm not sure which far, far phase of faith your Christian experience is. I have to leave that up to you. But the call today is as God called Jacob, return to your father's home. That is a call that is coming to you and me, my brothers and sisters. God is asking you today to return to your father's home. Maybe on your journey back to your father's home, you may encounter a struggle, a Jacob's struggle. You may encounter difficulties, but the assurance is never give up. Hold on 
Cling on until you are blessed so that you can journey safely into that promised land. May the Lord be with you and may he bless you. I want to pray for the church and I want to ask you to recommit yourself to God because every Sabbath is a time when we come and recommit ourselves to God, refresh our hearts and minds to God. So therefore, with this thought and with this message that the Lord has given to us today, I want to pray for church at Kingston. I want to pray for its members. I want to pray for its believers, its young people and the children. May we reverently bow down our heads, Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful opportunity and privilege that you have given to us. To understand and know life's valuable lessons through the life of Jacob. We thank you, Father, that you have blessed us abundantly with great men like Jacob, Esau, Abraham. We thank you, Father, for all these men who had stood firm in their faith, no matter what struggles and trials that they have encountered. Reading their stories, we too realize that we are in similar situation. But reading their stories, we too understand now that there is hope, there is courage, and there is comfort when we turn our faces towards you. Father, we also now have a hope that no matter how far we go away or run away from you, you are always with us and traveling and journeying with us and helping us reach into that promised land. Father, we thank you for that great mercy and grace that you have showered upon us in all our wrongdoings, in all our weaknesses. Lord, we are unworthy, but you have blessed us abundantly. And at this moment, we like to thank you for those blessings. We pray for our church at Wilston. We pray that you be with all the members together, Father. We pray that you be with the leaders. We pray that you be with the pastor. Pray that you be with the elders, with all of them, and bless them and keep them. You go before them and open doors for them. May your plans be fulfilled in their life. Whatever plans that they have laid for the church, may you be at the forefront and bless these plans, Lord. We pray for the parents. We pray for the young people, Lord. Be with their hearts and minds. May they learn to continue to surrender and submit their lives towards you. May they put you first in their lives. May they bring everything that they belongs to belong to them and sur surrender at them at your feet. And may you make choices for them in their lives. May you protect them and keep them. May they be a shining light to the community. Thank you, Father, for uh, doing, giving us so much blessings in our life. And as we depart from here, may your blessings continue to be with us for the rest of the week. May you give us the strength and bless each and every one of us. And we ask you to forgive our sins and so therefore we can be ready for your soon coming. May you protect us and guide us from all the pestilence that is around us. And may you keep us safe until we meet next time. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. from it is that it doesn't matter what situation we find ourselves in. God always make a way out for us. And therefore we need to just trust him. And so we give you thanks and praise for the message of hope that you have given to us. Because of the time factor and the, the next program is to start fairly soon. Let's take our hymn and turn to the hymn for 340. Jesus save. 340. Jesus save. We have heard a joyful song. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Steeps and cross the way. 
communion of the Holy Spirit with us now and forever. Amen. 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 Amen.